After receiving this book from Cobalt Press in my mailbox, I immediately opened it up and started comparing it to this book from Nord Games. But I came to quickly find out that that doesn't make any sense at all, as they are both written with a complete different game master in mind. Hi there fellow role players and game masters, my name is Mr. Tarask and this is your go-to YouTube channel for everything Cobalt Press and today I want to talk about the campaign builder Cities and Towns from Cobalt Press. Now I have to admit I didn't follow this project in the same sense as I follow some of their other projects like Project Black Flag and their monster books and the books that have campaigns and player options and all that stuff. This also has player options by the way but this book kind of went under the radar for me until Cobalt Press sent it to me. Me, and I opened it up and I absolutely love it because I was really surprised about how they handle everything in here. Now I want to quickly compare it to this one and then I will shut up about Spectacular Settlements which is a really good book but some people have asked me the question, well most people ask me the question what is the difference? Well the difference is for whom it is written. This one is written for a game master who's looking for a Spectacular Settlement and a, they are looking for a town or a city or or a port or whatever and this they say it in the back on the back the main title here is an engine of inspiration this thing is more for a person who wants a city to just put in their game either by taking one of the pre-generated cities uh, in this book some of the amazing pre-generated cities in the book slap it into their game or use the really cool random rolling system to generate your own city with its own politics and own NPCs and own like its own inns and bars and places to go and points of interest for all of that stuff this book is really great but if you are the kind of dungeon master that every now and then likes to take a cup of coffee or a cup of tea or a beer in the evening whatever sit down at their table and really start campaign building if you are the game master that loves to like prepare 70 80 maybe even 90 percent of their game world before introducing it to their players this one is for you the wisdom and and everything that is in here from the campaign designers and the writers it is really great and on top of all of that stuff you even get some really cool other stuff that is in here and there's one thing in here that i like a little bit less so without further ado let's get in it in it in into it so before we take a look at the PDF, I just want to quickly talk about what you get for your money if you actually end up buying this thing for yourself. So let's talk about the contents in here. And some of the contents might surprise you, at least they surprised me, because I didn't follow the project like I followed other projects. Some of the contents in here surprised me and I love them. I love them for being in here, which is really great. So first of all, of course, there is guidance on all aspects of urban planning from trade goods to architecture and all of the stuff is in here there is uh, politics uh, religion hierarchy uh, all of that stuff is in here to build your perfect city to build your perfect town or any other settlement on that spectrum right so they kind of guide you through the entire process and that is the thing about this book for me this book is more a book that you sit down with and read there are random rolling tables uh, that, that help you decide on the random stuff for your town but for me it is the wisdom in the text that really they kind of just hold your hand and guide you through the creation through the campaign builder process without telling you exactly what to do they're just saying you should think about this then you should think about this and then you sh should think about this and i think the main premise of this book is to kind of learn teach you how to do that and then afterwards you don't even need this book anymore because you can do it just for yourself if you become experienced in it right so but then the npcs rulers guilds and cults to populate your metropolis so yes they talk about npcs even with stat blocks and i love them being in there but there's like one or two things that i love less about that more information when i reached the pdf that point in the pdf uh but this one is really cool i didn't expect this new character options to help urban heroes 
survive and thrive. So there are character options in here that I really, really, really love. There's two in here that I would immediately pick up and play. There's new spells even. Uh, there are some spells that really make sense. There is a divination spell that I absolutely adore. I really love divination wizards. So new divination spells for me is always really cool. The spell is called City Sight. I will talk about that in a bit. And there is just a bunch of character options, subclasses for you to use, which is great to have in a book like this and I didn't expect it uh, and then there is a bounty of tables from name generators all the way up to urban encounters and yes there is a big ass table with a bunch of names that kind of sound some of them sound Arabic some more Western some more Asian so they kind of uh, uh, work towards that real world thing that Midgard kind of is based on and also uh, urban encounters random encounter table and Cobalt Press again does the great thing of giving you a monster uh, a random encounter with monsters from the tomb of beasts one two three or the creature codex and if you don't own that book they also give you another creature that you might uh, want to use instead from the free to download basic rules of fifth edition so it is usable for everybody but it's extra cool for people who own Cobalt presses monster books and here it is, ladies and gentlemen, the PDF of the Campaign Builder Cities and Towns by Cobalt Press. As you can see, a really cool cover of a wizard or something like that trying to take a nap, short rest, long rest, I don't know, uh, on the floor of a city. But the guard is like, no, that's not allowed. You didn't pay your taxes or whatever. So here, have a jab of his peer. Um, so <laughs> it's really cool artwork. And then we can see kind of like the, um, the inside of the book. So as you can see, there is is one two three four like there's three i'm gonna say three chapters about like the actual city creation there is the city planning there is this autonomy of a city and there is the city inhabit inhabitants so with the inhabitants they talk about uh rulers city rulers city officials nobles guilds craft guilds merchant guilds other guilds, their city watch, they go so incredibly deep into this. But for, from the first section, they start out with saying that, hey, um, you might feel like you are becoming overwhelmed, but don't fear because number one is the city planning and they kind of go off of these five questions. What is your city's age is the question uh, number one. So you can roll the age to come up with the age and then for each, and this isn't through the entire book. So they come up with with a section about something, right? And they give you a um, random rolling table table right here. And then they go into uh, what that kind of means or what that potentially means um, for your city. Um, so they don't tell you like, oh, that's exactly this, where the other book um, from Nord Games is like you roll and then they say it's exactly this. You can change it around, of course, but this is what you get. And then you like have this tool set to create your entire city. This is more like here. Oh, you have a new city. Read, read this section. If you have an older city, read another section, which is really uh, great to have, to my opinion. As you can see, there's also the function of a, a city, which is another what is your city's function is probably yes that is question number two what is your city's function uh it could be creation all kinds of creation export military function some cities just exist to be to be an outpost a military an outpost just on a strategic position like hey there's a river there a crossing where a lot of ships need to cross for trade routes we need a city there so we can defend that uh religion is a thing tourism even which is something I have to admit I've never used in any of my games. A city that is like 70-80% of, it, of its income from tourism. Like some cities in the real world. Which is actually makes a lot of sense. In a world that's like in Midgard. Now this is not built for Midgard alone. But like I always feel as if it's like written kind of for Midgard, right? So uh, in Midgard where I play, this would make sense. Uh, trade routes and um, uh, travel. So that's really cool. And all these questions, what are the city's trades goods? So if you become, uh, let's say um, your city is more of an export uh, or a creation kind of thing that you can really tie into what the trade goods are because if they create, I don't know, wooden figures or whatever, chess boards, I don't know, you're your trade good will probably become chessboard, but it could be wider than that. Maybe you are near a lake, maybe you are near the sea, maybe you are in the mountains.
mountains where you do a, where they do a lot of hunting and like uh, bear skins and all that jazz becomes your trade goods which all makes sense and there's all kinds of uh, random rolling tables throughout this entire book I will not scroll through the entire book by the way don't don't fear um so they kind of talk about uh, trade goods, optional trade goods by region. So you could have a coast region, a desert region, uh, agricultural, uh, oh man, that's such a different, difficult word, so farming region, uh, forest region and jungle region. And then they are like, yeah, you can have uh, wine or salt or uh, copper. Salt could work in the desert, but salt could also work in the coast, uh, lumber, which is for forests, but also furs and uh, berries and uh, yeah, all kind of jungle, just animals. And then they give this entire table to kind of give you an idea of what that is worth, what these things are worth when scarcity is low, medium or high, which I think is, uh, is a really cool table to have because uh, let's say uh, a cask of ale, is three gold pieces if it is widely available it is seven gold pieces if it is somewhat available and it costs you all the way up to 15 gold pieces pieces if the scarcity is high so it is not that wildly uh widely available so there's more there's mountains there's all and this is what happens through the entire book so they give you a kind of they give you an idea or a question or whatever you answer that by rolling on a table or deciding from the table and then they you read the part of the book that you that that belongs to that or you read different parts and then you make your decision kind of to guide you through what questions do you need to be asking yourself in order to uh yeah to kind of build your own city or your own town my computer's super slow at the moment uh another thing uh they go into the anatomy of and and that anatomy of the city uh like uh, let's just scroll through that section really quickly that's page 33 if i'm not mistaken so it's right here so um land features land mass they give you examples of how a city could grow which i think is really cool so you can have life like the city right here that's a village then becomes like somewhat of a city-ish thing and then suddenly it becomes this big thing and they give you kind of like examples on how that can happen what reasons there are for a city to grow and what ways and all that stuff and um i could talk about this for ages, which I won't be doing. Um, what I want to do is kind of show you this book, but not like completely. For example, um, let's look at the uh, city campaigns. So here, they once you've built your city, kind of, they go into like, how can you... How can you play and run a campaign in a city? So newcomer encounters, there's encounter tables here. Uh, they talk about quest hubs. They talk about all that stuff. They even have a taxing system, which I think is uh, just just defeats the purpose of a tabletop RPG completely for me. I don't want to do taxes. Not even I don't want to even say the word taxes. They even go in here saying taxation process simplified to get a simpler version of taxes. But taxes, nope, nope, nope. For me, that's a big nope in a tabletop RPG that I run. Don't want to do that. Don't want to get into that. But for some people, they might want like this... Um, uh, fantasy version of the real world and they want to uh, to be more like a simulator a fantasy living simulator basically it says if you uh, have a bunch of magic items or you are this rich rich or that rich per magic item you have to pay taxes yearly or monthly or whatever it's cool it's a cool thing it's a cool system to have but i don't feel it right but just to show you kind of like the depth of how deep they go into it right so um there's this entire city campaigns uh all kinds of stuff there's uh yeah how people react uh witnesses can react to certain situations how they can 
interpret interpret certain situations, events that can happen, a staging ID generator. So there could be a trial, a wake, a wedding, a feast, a all of that stuff to like make your cities come to life is in here basically. And this all comes from these crazy good writers from Cobalt Press who know how to build a world. But then what I really like about this is okay, you got this urban encounter, you got your city, you built your city with this book, you built your village with this book, whatever, you got leaders, you got factions, you got guilds, you got all that crap going on. 80% of your city is completely fleshed out and you're leaving like 20% for improvisation from your players and from yourself at the game table, which makes it more fun for me. That's where it gets really cool because um, now we can talk about, uh, let's see, uh, there are new backgrounds and there are new uh, archetypes and subclasses. So I just want to go right here and that is really cool. I think introducing this makes it a, I don't know, the title of the third edition book, 3.5, but it was this book that was all about city adventure and urban stuff. And it also had like subclasses and ideas to not only build good cities, build good campaigns around cities, urban campaigns, but also have cool um, player characters come to life and actually um, make player characters that make sense within the city. Again, there's new there's new backgrounds even, right? So there is even a Red Folk Paladin in here, which is really cool. The Paladin Sacred Oath, Oath of Revolution. So there's, there's a freaking Red Folk Paladin right here. I really love this. Uh, this will probably end up in my thumbnail. But the two subclasses that I would immediately pick up and play are these two. What you're seeing here is the Wizard Arcane Tradition Street Magic. Yes, Street Magic. And then there is a uh, roguish, roguish Archetype Skirmish Surgeon. As you can see, this is literally a surgeon who heals people by doing all kinds of crazy stuff. As you can see, he's tapping off blood from uh, somebody he's trying to heal. And I really like the idea behind this because the first thing I re read when I was reading through this, uh, I saw that s you gut people in places in order to heal them. And that made little sense to me in game gaming terms like no i want to roll a die so i can heal them i don't want to cut them i don't want to stab them and then i thought like yeah sometimes if you i don't know hurt your leg from an accident or whatever they have to cut up cut off your foot in order for you to survive that's basically hurting you in order to heal you and that's what the field surgeon uh the skirm i'm calling it the field surgeon field surgeon is doing so they can do all kinds of stuff. So they uh, become proficient in the medicine skill if you don't already have it, and you can proficiency with the alchemist's tools. Um, cutting also, you can also use bonus action gained by your cunning action to make a medicine check on yourself or one creature within five feet of you, which is already absolutely pretty cool immediately. Now, some people consider a medicine. I know people who consider a medicine check a bonus action, but that makes zero sense for me if you don't heal people by magical means or whatever so what you can do is starting at third level you understand that precise cuts in the body can be just as efficient uh, at helping as harming so uh bleed the vein uh, field patch so what you can do is you can make a wisdom medicine check and then you can um, consult this table basically to see what happens. So your target regains uh, hit point, one hit point plus your wisdom modifier, one d4 plus wisdom modifier, one the uh, regains temporary hit points, and this one is normal hit points, the same amount but normal hit points. So that's basically the idea of the field medic. I absolutely love it. Uh, I don't per se love the artwork. That's not how I would play it. I would like really legit build one of those fantasy versions of a World War II medic from the movies. That's how I would do it. Like the patch and everything is, is correct. And I would be like, yeah, I'm going to medic you. And I'm going to heal you medic. You know, that kind of stuff. Then there is a street magic dude, which I would just play to be a street magician. Um, basically, what they can do is they have a parlor trick. Uh, which gives you as uh, an action you can create one of the following minor magical effects for example you can draw a card from a deck that somebody is imagining uh, conjure the targets uh, favorite flower uh, 
all of that stuff, uh, co correctly guess the character's name, to change die roll uh, for something, pull a coin from the target's homeland from behind its ear. Now, the reason why I like this is because in a previous life, um, a few years ago, I, I was a magician. I, wa I was a magician. Like, I was a part of my living living was standing on a stage and doing magical acts uh so i really like that this is in here and i really like the way they approach it especially the copy spell uh feature at sixth level you can basically see somebody do a spell right they cast a spell or a, i don't know fireball whatever and you can kind of like remember their moves and their words and just mimic that for a day so for a day you can cast that spell, that same spell, because you're mimicking it. You don't know how to cast it like, you don't know why it's working or how it's working. You just, it just works for you, right? So that is really, really cool for a wizard uh, to have. So you're just a wizard who copies spells from other people who can cast spells. And then there is this spell I was talking about um, earlier when I was while well, still holding the physical book, which is City Sight. City Sight is really cool, where it's a divination spell, where you basically, you can say like, hey, I want to go to the to an inn, I don't know, the funky fish tavern or whatever. And I know it exists, so you will know where it is, you know, well, you will know the shortest route, you will know the distance, all of that stuff. And that's kind of like, I like those kinds of spells that um, really add to the flavor of the role-playing and the flavor of the game outside of combat i'm really like a narrative person i like combat i like having this combat but i also narrate my combat like a lot as a game master every time that like one or two players do an action after that i just go into it and i just play out this entire movie for them how it all happened simon simon Talius, simon that word you know what i mean so city side just ties into that um Kind of like that idea of how to play 5th uh, uh, edition or whatever uh, for me personally. So I really like that. There's new spells in here. All kinds of spells. Cobblestone Quake, for example. Look at this. So there's a bunch of tiles that could just come up from the earth. There's also a city inhabitants and monsters. Yes, there's even a few monsters in this book that could crawl through a city like a bookworm and stuff like that. I will uh, look at that in a bit. But the city inhabitants are a bunch of people that you could encounter as a player or you could run as a game master for your players. For example, an alchemist, an artist, uh, a, a Ganny beggar, which was basically not a poor, poor person, but acts like being poor so they can get free money. A crafter, a curator, a food pads, a groom, whatever, a lamp lighter, all that stuff. So this is a lamp lighter, it's basically just a person who lights a lamp, right? Um, all of those, and all of those come with a stat block. And here is a little bit of the downside of the boot, like something that should, for me, doesn't need to be in here. Now, some people might find a use for this. I'm not trying to break this book down because it's a great book. It's a really great book. But some, some stat blocks in here are just for the sake of having a stat block. That's how I feel. So there is an artist, right? Which they describe what is an artist. What does that mean in a city? All that stuff. And then they have a stat block for an artist. And they basically have nine hit points. They have some strength, dex, con, intelligence. And they have the tool of the trade, proficient with one set of artisan's tools. And then they have an attack because they can... And they just literally say to you like they can stab you with a sculptor or, or whatever they are working with uh, depending on... Uh, the art they're doing if they they're drawing they might be able to stab you with a feather or something a quiver or something and i um i just think that's a stat lock for the sake of having a stat lock i think they should have really i they could really easy say like hey just use the commoner stat lock or whatever and maybe give them uh, uh an improvised weapon proficiency or something like that and instead of like writing an entire stat block for these people that chances are you are never going to fight as a player because these are not meant to be fought 
right? These are NPCs. You might want to fight them, but there's options enough of like basic stat blocks that you, you can just modify on the fly uh, with like one extra attack or whatever, what makes sense for the character that you use that stat block for. But having a stat block for every single one of these just feels a bit meh for me. Like, like a monarch? Okay, they are trained. They have their thing going on where they have good armor they probably got fencing lessons and stuff like that they are a challenge rated six creature you might at want to fight them in order to throw them off their throne or whatever so this makes sense having a stat block of this makes sense but like a lamplighter stat block for a lamplighter i don't know why freaking lamp lamplighter that's just for me a bit overkill and yeah just not necessary but again, I love the book and they probably had a reason to put these in here. Uh, but then they go into the monsters and there are some cool things here in here. There's an alley sprite in here. There's a bookworm in here. And now I often call my girlfriend a bookworm. I will rethink that because she doesn't look like this. She's like this creature is way more beautiful than my girlfriend. I mean, my girlfriend is way more beautiful. They both have glasses, though. And teeth, but that's about it. So um, there is a whatever other stuff that is in here. So the bookworm, the like crazy creatures that you will find in and around a city, which I think is really cool. Uh, of course, what is a city without a mimic, right? Uh, there is a mimic on a leash, a pet mimic. Really cool. There's also a lock mimic, mimic uh, like they say right here, uh, which just wants to eat your fingers if you try to unlock it. There's all kinds of new um, creatures, sewer blob, blah, 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 um, which I think is a really great addition to a book like this because you have built your town, you have built your city, it all makes sense, your characters are all playing a subclass or most of them are playing a subclass that makes sense for an urban encounter, an urban campaign and now you also have some of the bad guys you can use for urban encounters. I really love that they added that into this book. And that is basically it for the campaign builder cities and towns. No, I'm lying. That is not it. There's way more. Um, they go so incredibly deep into the campaign building for cities and towns and every settlement on that spectrum. But if I want to make a video covering everything that's in here, I'd probably sit here for like six hours explaining to you what's in here and I wouldn't have scratched the surface. Um, so it is, to my opinion, well worth your money if you are the kind of dungeon master that really wants to sit down and build a campaign as opposed to just take a city and start running a game you this one is for me built to like sit down and actually build your campaign flesh out your world flesh out your cities before you even start and before you even introduce the city to your players it's an incredible read it has incredible wisdom and it will help you build better campaigns. There's also random rolling tables in the back for name generator, random uh, encounter tables, all that stuff you can expect and much, much, much more. Until next video, bye-bye.